Good morning, everyone. A few announcements. Welcome to those here with us and to those watching online today. Last Sunday, we were challenged by missionary David Waters as he spoke about the work he and his wife Robin are doing in Papua New Guinea and the importance of disciple making. If you would like to help the Waters in their work in Papua, please mark your check made out to Ripley or offering envelope. Please mark it Waters and, and drop it in the offering box. Thank you to everybody who has been contributing to the OCC shoebox collection. Over the summer months, the mission committee is asking for clothing and toys. In August, the focus will be on back-to-school items. This past week, the Vacation Bible School kids zoomed around Australia, Australia learning about the value and purpose of life from the lives of preborn babies to eternal life in the kingdom of God, and how out of his great love, God offers us salvation through his son Jesus. Thank you to the many volunteers who helped make the Vacation Bible School possible. God bless you for your commitment in sharing the gospel with the children. As they say, what goes up must come down. So today, after the morning service, we will be taking down the Vacation Bible School decoration. For those who have strong muscles and a half hour to spare, your help in moving furniture back into place will be greatly appreciated. Please stay and help. And as Vacation Bible School 2022 comes to an end, here is a video recapping the week.
I just want to say thank you to all the volunteers, everybody that helped. It was a great week. Um, we had as many volunteers as we had kids on some days, which is great. I mean, to think of all the adults that gave time and, and even people that prayed and thought of us during the week and helped beforehand, helped with the float. A lot of hands went together to, to make it a good week. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just going to read off the names of... Um, the volunteers that spent the week with us and Chad and Caleb, oh, he's back there, are going to um, hand out a little treat. It says, it's a Tootsie Roll Pop. It says, thank you for playing your role at VBS so perfectly. So um, if you could stand or raise your hand, if you feel like taking a bow, whatever you want to do, do a little dance. Elena Davis, Ammon. Annie, Bonnie Lee, and Bonnie Ryan. All the way up here. Oh, he's got. Yeah. Yeah. Raise a hand at least so they know where to find you. Did you find Bonnie Lee? There we go. Kathy, she might be in the back, and Stevie, so we can catch them after. Uh, Caleb and Chad, Dave Ryan, I don't know if he's here, okay, and uh, Debbie Ryan, David Robinson, he's way up here, and Holly's not here, uh, Dawn Hall is downstairs, so you don't need to worry about her, we'll get her later, uh, Denise, there she is. Oh, Don Ryan. Don't go far, Chad. He got it? Okay. And Eric, Pastor Eric. Jenny Gross. Julia Burkholder. 
Do you recognize her? <laughs> Sarah Smith. Seth. Sharon Beck. I don't see Sharon either. And Virgie. And Deb Dittman. So, like I said, there were many others that helped with the float and preparing crafts and all that stuff ahead of time. So, thank you again very much. If, it, if we have kids here, come on up. We're going to sing a song, and you all are going to sing with us so that you get a taste of one of the easier songs that they sang this week. So, kids, come on up. Yeah, okay. Okay, you don't have to. Okay, but you can sing with me, and it's, it'll be up here. So you guys need to sing along with us. Like I said, it's an easy song, and you'll enjoy it very much. So. Yeah, one for me. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great guy. Than a dingo. Oh, yeah. You know, we ain't just talking about another branch on the family tree. We're talking about a different tree. Uh, we're talking about trees. Thought we're talking about animals. Uh, animal trees. Just sing the song, mate. A bit faster this time. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh, yeah. We're made different. For example, have you ever heard a camel try and sing? No, but birds can sing. Fair point. Very repetitive lyrics, though. <laughs> Let's try it faster. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great guy. I just wanted to say the kids sang great all week long. It was fantastic. It did take a while for us to get that song. So don't feel too bad if you didn't get it. I'm really jealous if you taught them to sing that with an Australian accent. I would have wanted to be there. Our scripture today will be from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. If you'd like to follow along, it's in uh, your pew Bible on page 1265, 1 Timothy chapter 6. My friends, I'm going to read the word of God. Let's honor our Father. Will you stand with me? 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting with verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfast, steadfastness, gentleness. 
Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Thank you. Remain standing for more worship. Let's sing together Jehovah Jireh, my provider.
we uh, go to prayer this morning, I will begin with scripture from uh, James chapter 1. And as we close today, I'll ask you to say the Lord's Prayer together with me. Let's pray. My dear brothers, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's angry anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we want to thank you for the week that we had with Vacation Bible School. And as we pray for these young people that were here, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would draw them to the Father, that you would remind them regularly of those memory verses that they quoted and the lessons that were taught, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, even at an early age. And we thank you for each one that was here, and may your hand be upon them. And then, Father, we pray this morning that as we have gathered, and as the Word says, that uh, we should not only listen to the Word, but we should do the Word. We know that your Word is holy, Your word is living, and Lord, we know that your word is what the Holy Spirit uses to guide and direct us as the body of Christ. So I pray, Lord, that today, as we listen to your word, that you would clear our minds and clear our hearts, help us to take that word in and remember it and be obedient to it throughout this coming week. And Father, I pray that your word would go with us wherever we go, that we would be ready at any time to give a reason when people ask why we are the way we are because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you that you were willing to give of your life, that we could have life, And we desire to share that with those who do not know you as Lord and Savior. And I pray, Father, that as Pastor Eric comes and uh, brings the word, that, Lord, you would be with him. You would uh, uh, clear his mind, uh, that you would control his words and the intent of his heart as he brings the message from your holy word. And may he bring it with boldness and clarity, in spirit and in truth. Pray with me now the Lord's Prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, it's great to see you all here today, and we did have a, a great vacation Bible school week, a wonderful, wonderful time. So thank you all. I want to do the same. I want to thank you all for your help and participation. Um, Jana wanted me to pass on as well that uh, we had, as our mission focus this week, Abigail Pregnancy Services, offices in Willard and Norwalk, to help moms and dads and families and, and babies and those that are going to potentially have babies or need counseling or help. And uh, so our goal with the kids... Um, was to raise, we had two levels, $250 that they would bring in and give as an offering, and they did it throughout the week. Each day they gave some, and, uh, and then we also had another goal of 700 And so they surpassed the first goal, I think, in, on day two, and then they actually brought in $701 and some odd change. So they surpassed their ultimate goal of 700 So we'll pass that on to uh, the pregnancy services there and Norwalk and Willard, and, and that will uh, benefit those families. So kids, great job. We're so proud of them for, for that effort. So let's take time now to uh, look into God's Word. If you would open your text to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Also, the things you see on the platform, tangible items too, uh, for the Richland, or the Abigail Pregnancy Services as well. So we appreciate that as well. All right, well, let's, we've had a couple weeks um, since I was, was in First Timothy, and I appreciate Don uh, preaching the word recently, and then David Waters last week. So I've got a couple tie-ins to Don's um, message two weeks ago, and also to what David Waters shared as well, so we'll get to those a little bit later. Uh, but uh, all of these things are interwoven seamlessly as, as uh, these men uh, also preach God's Word and, and share what God is doing. So we're grateful for that. So let's take a look at our text first, uh, 1 Timothy 6. And as you're looking in your Bible, look at verse 11 and 12. You'll see there that the text for today that A.J. read for us. Um, but as we understand what he's saying uh, in verse 11. We're going to have to look up in the, in the verses uh, just ahead of that, and we'll do that in here in a second. But let's start first with this. He says first, but as for you, O man of God. So who's saying it, and who's he saying it to? Well, this is the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy. So when he says, O man of God, he's talking to Timothy here. Um, and so when he also uh, says this, we see a shift in the text when he says, but as for you. So we see up above that, Paul was warning Timothy about some things in the local church there, and then he's going to shift gears and talk specifically to Timothy. So Timothy was, of course, the pastor of that church there in, in Ephesus, and he was supposed to preach and teach the correct doctrine of Jesus. And there were people in that particular church and other churches that were struggling with those who were opposing the true message of Christ. And they were, some of the leaders in these churches and others were, were sharing and teaching and talking about things that were incorrect doctrine. And so Paul was warning Timothy to root this out and tell these folks to stop. So that's what was taking place in the verses above uh, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. And... We also see here that not only is Paul talking to Timothy, when he says, oh man of God, he's talking specifically to Timothy, but he also is by extension speaking to the leaders of this church and every other church that exists. Not only that, all of you today here uh, who are not a, uh, a pastor or elders, you are called the laity of the church uh, in scripture and other places. This message is for you as well. So what we're going to hear today, the principles here uh, are also for you and for me, for Don and Barney, for all of us of this local church of Ripley. So now that we understand that there's a shift in the text here, let's take a look at what that shift is all about. He says to him two things, flee certain things, and I put those in yellow. The next slide, as you can see, are pursue those things. So flee and pursue. There we go. We'll go back. So these verses are the things above which Paul is warning Timothy is going on in the local churches. And friends, as I uh, preached, I think the very last time that I did, we see these very same problems in the modern church, especially the prosperity gospel preachers, the word of faith preachers, uh, a lot of, not all, but a lot of mega church pastors that are 
using religion and Christianity or the Bible to, they twist it up and make it about money, about their prosperity. They claim you can prosper as well, but they're the ones that end up with uh, multiple Learjets and mansions and all the riches. Uh, but, but this kind of twisting is what Paul is warning Timothy about. So that's all in the yellow. We've already gone over this. But you can see a little idea of what he's telling Timothy to flee from. He's saying, hey, Timothy is a pastor. Watch out, guard yourself uh, against these things yourself, but also root them out of the local church. So we see those who desire to be rich, uh, the temptation and snare of wealth, uh, the senseless and harmful desires that come out of those things, the love of money, uh, which brings all kinds of evils, plural, um, cravings. And through these things, um, some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many pangs. Notice the words there, the faith. Remember how we've talked about this in the past. The faith there with the definite article, the. The is going to be an important word today. So Annie, one of the important words today is the. The. She thought I was going to say Jesus. Yes, that's true, Annie. But the word the, friends, is important today. When it's added in the text, it is a very specific thing being pointed out. So as we look at the faith, it's talking about this, friends. It's talking about the truth. The faith equals the truth of Scripture. Now, AJ, I know my friend AJ and my brother in Christ very well. He has learned the faith over the years, but AJ has also put his face or, or place his faith in Christ. You see how that works, friends? We must understand what the faith is, and then we, of course, must receive what Christ has done for us and put our faith in Christ. There's the difference. So sadly, because of the things that Paul is saying to Timothy, flee from those things, some had wandered from the truth. Some had wandered from the truth of Scripture, and because they did, what was the result? What was the result? They pierced themselves through with many pains and pangs. So that's a warning for all of us that we don't depart from the faith, the Word of God, uh, as it should be taught through the Holy Spirit by the apostles. All right, so those are the things that he was warned to flee from. He was also told to pursue so pursue these things in the green. We're going to look at those uh, just briefly today. But you could go home and you could look them up and, and uh, Bible concordance and you could study these more in depth for yourself if you'd like. But let's just take a, a quick look at them. So it says pursue righteousness. What's that mean? Well, are any of us righteous on our own? Absolutely not. None of us are good. There is no good human being except for Christ alone, except for Jesus. Um, people can do good things. And this was a concept we taught to the kids at Vacation Bible School. Kids, you can do good things, but also within your soul are things, or the thing called sin. And that sin corrupts everything about us. And so the righteousness described here, of course, first starts with who? Who is the only righteous one? The righteous human? Jesus, right. So this righteousness described here is to be pursued by Timothy. First of all, he is to understand that Timothy's righteousness comes from Jesus alone. But then beyond that, friends, beyond that, if Timothy is born again, are you born again, spiritually born? If so, then there ought to be a change within our souls brought by the Holy Spirit. And then guess what? As we pursue the righteousness of Christ, then we desire to live under Christ's commandments in increasing measure. Do you see that? There's the spiritual first and then the practical. Both are part of pursuing righteousness. Christ first, and then as he saves us, then we desire to obey Christ's commands all the more. Listen to what Jesus himself said. If you all are really my disciples, then you will obey my commandments. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if we want to pursue righteousness of Christ, uh, God saves us, and then we are to keep his commandments more and more and more. Can people say that about us, that they see us growing and changing? Well, that person's different than he used to be. Why? Well, it's because Christ saved him, and now he is pursuing Christ and his righteousness. 
All right, the next one is godliness. Simply on the, on the screen there, you can see what does godliness mean? Well, it means we have a reverence for God, a respect for God. So many people have told me wonderful information this past week. I don't even know who told me. Maybe they'll raise their hand. Um, maybe it was Jana, so I'm sorry. But um, might have been your sister Anne, I think. Uh, but someone said that in, in England, Great Britain, only 31% of people believe in God. 31% believe there's a God that exists. The rest are like, nah, unimpressed or don't care, don't believe. In the United States, it fares a little better. 80 some percent say that there is a God of some kind. But friends, that number is, is falling, it's declining. So you think, well, is this a big deal? Yes. Godliness is a big deal, a reverence for God, a respect for God, even acknowledging there is a God, most of the world doesn't care about the true creator God. Now they have their gods. Some people have themselves as their God, but the true God, that godliness is being described here, many, many do not. And of course, we really can't have ultimate reverence for God, the Father, unless we are born again through whom? Through Christ. We really can't have godliness if we're not in Christ. So the other part of that is the, the second bullet point. We are devoted to God with our focus on pleasing him with our lives. That is also part of godliness. That's a big part of it as well. Revering God and then living for him with our lives. The next one is faith. We know the word faith quite often. We must put our trust, our faith, our allegiance in Christ to be saved. But this word also in the Greek can mean an assurance or guarantee. This is fascinating. I love this. Watch how this works in Acts. Whoops. I wondered if I'd trip over some stuff. Excuse me. Kick the little rice puffs out of the way. Um, Acts 17 30 says this, God commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Who is that man? It's Christ. That's Jesus in the red there. And of this, he has given assurance. That's the same word in the Greek, pistis. He has given assurance or faith, but assurance in this case to all by what? How does he give you all assurance? raising him from the dead. That was what we talked to the, the kids at VBS about, that because Jesus was raised from the dead, it proved that what Christ did on the cross was worthy, worthwhile. His sacrifice was received by the Father. This is a wonderful verse. Y'all need assurance? Write this down. Read this often. Read this verse. God is gonna judge the world. And when it says the world there, we're talking about what I'll mention later, the fallen world system. God will judge the fallen world system by, in righteousness by Christ, whom he has appointed. And also he has given us assurance by Christ, and then ultimately by raising him from the dead. So when it talks here about the word faith, pursue faith, it does mean salvation faith. It does mean put your faith in Christ. But can you not see how Paul was saying to Timothy, Paul, or Timothy, you need assurance? Pursue Christ. Pursue your faith in Christ, and also you will be given assurance. What's the quickest way for us all to feel, um, have days where we don't feel, I'm not even a Christian today? Well, often we're not pursuing this. We forget temporarily, we go temporarily insane, and we forget the word of God, and we, we bring ourselves down, and, and we forget to focus on Christ. As we pursue these things, it will renew our minds it will refresh our minds. And at times in my own life, it's brought me up out of these doldrums, these pits that I get into as I pursue these things. It's so true. If you find yourself there, the immediate remedy is to go to the faith, the word, the truth, and pursue these things. And as you do, your assurance will return as you pursue the truth of Christ. So good. The next one is love. The word here, agape, in the, in the Greek simply means love. And you've heard a lot of other definitions given to agape. You know how we do that or why we do that? It's because we look in the Bible and we find where it's used, the context. And we say, oh, okay, agape love means some of these other things. From a biblical context, it means a sacrificial type of love. There are uh, four, actually three other words for love, but this one in particular is used in conjunction with God's sacrifice of Christ. For God so agape loved the world. You see, 
the fallen people of the world, that he gave his only begotten son. So that's agape love. We see tied to sacrificial love. Also, it's a love given by choice, even to those undeserving. We see that in other verses and other contexts. So friends, this is not just to Timothy, but it's to Bill, it's to you and me, right? We're to pursue this kind of love, aren't we? We have to love people as Christians that don't deserve our love. Because guess, guess what? Bill, you and I didn't deserve God's love, did we? But he freely gave it. Isn't that cool? This is powerful. So as you and I pursue this kind of a love, because of what God did for us, that impacts others. Let me ask you this. What's the ultimate form of agape? What did God, did he, what did God do? He came and he sent his son to die to save us. So what's our best form of agape love? What can we do to mimic that? We take the message of Christ to who? Those lost in sin. You see it? That is the highest form of agape love for us, to take the faith, the truth, out to those that are perishing spiritually, and we share it with them. We, we sacrifice some of our time, our energy, our abilities to know the word, know the faith. We can share it. And then we, we give it the truth of Christ and, yes, our actual action type of love to those that even might be considered undeserving. So pursue that, Ripley Church. Pursue that too. The next one is steadfastness. This is an interesting word. It's hupomene. And um, I, I taught this, I remember this vividly. I taught to some of the, the, the kids, the youth here, um, probably about 12 or 13 years ago, but I vividly remember this. Because a lot of those kids at the time were into powerlifting. And uh, they, they had to do what? If they're going to squat a massive weight on the, on the Smith machine or the, 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 the unit that holds this bar and all these weights, what did they have to do? They had to get under and bear up under it. That's the, the, the nuance of this word here in the Greek, is to bear up under the load that you're under, the stress, the suffering. And it's kind of been going along where we've been in uh, Sunday school, correct? We, we, Christ suffered for us. We are also to bear up under the suffering of this life. So... We are to pursue a hupomene, the steadfastness, the bearing up under. We are to abide or stay under suffering, to bear up courageously under it. And, and there are three things that the scriptures guarantee or, or promise to us out of that. Actually, two of the promises and one was uh, encouragement to Timothy. Number one, God allows us to have these hardships in our life so that he will test our faith. That's from 1 Peter 1. It's to test and see if our faith is genuine or not. So when you go through something hard in your life, listen to yourself. Watch, if you can, know what I mean, watch yourself. Because you'll notice, oh, I said these things under great duress, or I thought these things. What does that mean to you? It's an indicator of, oh my, I need more growth. I need more growth. And then I would say to you today, Paul's encouragement to Timothy to pursue these things, of course, we're pursuing Christ, but these things will also, if you have a problem with the test that you failed spiritually, then you devote yourself to the word and to learning how you can bear up under suffering. And the word tells us how to do that. So number one, God is testing our faith in him to see where we are. And it's an indicator for us to know what we need to work on in our lives. Number two, it actually is also, James 1 tells us to mature our faith in him. As we go through hard things and we don't just run from them, but we bear up under them, we are changed. Now, when people are under the weight, they can do one of two things. Under the weight of these things, they can either uh, become bitter and angry, uh, which is go going away from God, or they can pursue these things of Christ and you can bear up under it and you can, I'm not just saying grin and bear it because that's more of like a, like a, a worldly thought, but it's, it's, it's somewhat true biblically. You, you bear up under it knowing that these temporary hard things, as the word says, are only small, light, and momentary compared to eternity. And what Christ is doing in you to mature you through these things are the most important thing. So we're to bear up under. Timothy here was, was to endure the battle with the false teachers in, in his church, and also it's for us today. So as we talk about false teachers, do you all know that a lot of these epistles, a lot of these letters written by these apostles, there's a lot of talk in you. Jesus himself said, watch out. Don't be deceived by many false teachers that will come. Many even claiming that they are a Christ of sorts. Watch out. So that is why we do spend the time here as 
pastors and elders uh, talking about these issues. Timothy was encouraged to endure, bear up under all the hard things he was going through. That's true for us as well. And the final one of this list is gentleness. There we go. Gentleness. Now, this is an interesting word um, in, in the Greek. I just, we'll just break it down. We won't go into the actual word, but we could. But, but first, there's this idea of an inner grace of a saved soul toward God. So a gentleness first is uh, directed toward God because of the grace he's enacting in our hearts by saving us. It's also linked in the words of the Greek. It's really beautiful. To other verses, it's linked to humility. And then secondly, it's about self-control. The words for self-control is linked to all this as well. Uh, Self-control is shown outwardly. So this idea of gentleness starts first with our recognition of God saving us, the grace that's come through Christ. That humbles us, right? Right, Jenny? When we realize the wretched sinners we are, you and I are, and what Christ has done for us, that humbles us. And our, our gentleness first is directed toward the beautiful grace of Christ in us. It humbles us, and then we live it outwardly through a self-controlled life. So those things are all connected. Gentleness is all wrapped up in those concepts. So those are, those are very helpful, aren't they? And, and if you just read through the list in your daily reading, you've taken five or 10 minutes, I you know, hope you would give it a little more, but if you're just reading through the list, you go, yeah, 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 I've heard all these things before. But if you'll take the time to dive down in, then you'll, you'll begin to understand it more deeply and it will help you. So I encourage you to take time to do that. So Timothy was to live these things as he, what's the next phrase in our text? Here it comes. Timothy was to to do those things, pursue those things, right? As he did this, fight the good fight of the faith. Now, Annie, what was our key word for the day? One of them? Thank you. The, very good. So we're going to look at all the thes in the text because they matter. So the first one here is the faith. And we've already, I've already touched on that. The faith here is the truth of God's word, the scripture which leads people to put their faith in Christ as Savior and, of course, King as well. So, first of all, we have to understand that this fight that we're talking about, the fight we're talking about here is for the faith. It's for this. Good doctrine, Scripture, the teaching of the Word of God, okay? The faith. So, I wanted to go ahead a little bit in our text. Look at this verse in 12b. Another the, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Paul is telling this to Timothy directly first, but I would submit, Ammon, that you and I are also called, right, to the eternal life through the faith. You see it? So the neat thing about this is the eternal life, the eternal life, I'll break that down more in a little bit, is absolutely connected to the faith, the truth of Scripture. It makes sense. But I want us to stop and pause and think about what's being said here. So, the faith. It has to be connected because how are you going to have eternal life in Christ if you don't first understand what God teaches us about Jesus in his word? You know, friends, there are numerous false religions out there that claim their own nirvana, their own paradise, their own bliss. But they're false religions. There's only one true eternal life. Do you ever think about it that way? There's only one true eternal life. All other religions lead to eternal what? Death and separation from God, the lake of fire. They do. So the eternal life is the only one through Christ. And the only way to live eternally in God's city, the new Jerusalem, One day in his new creation, of course, as well, is through this faith in Jesus, the, the way. You see the again, or the, the, the way. This is so amazing. So it's on you to go home this week and take these texts out and go, oh, okay. Reading back through it, Bill and I are going to go, oh, the, that's important. There's only one eternal life. There's only one way. That is through Christ. And then look at this. Oh, I love this. This is so good. There's a couple different Greek words for life. One is bios, huh, biology, biology class. One is zoe or zoology. So they both talk about 
life or living things, right? Bios, a little bit more about just the um, sort of like my heart is beating, my body is functioning, bios. Zoe has connotation of this, <clears throat> the condition of, a, of living conditions or a state of living, especially healthiness, happiness, exuberance, energy, vitality, and the like. So this eternal life in the new Jerusalem one day, forever and ever, is it just existing? Eh, just existing. My heart's beating. I'm here. Do you see what I'm going at here? Do you see what the word is going at? God's word is going at the fact that eternal life, the only one, has all of these things. Now, I am not going to stand up here and promise you in this life you're going to be absolutely healthy. I can't do that, can I, Bill? I can't tell you you're going to be healthy and happy every day of your life. That's what the word of faithers do. That is not a guarantee for this life. We're not quite to that new Jerusalem Zoe life. We're not, we're not there. Now, granted, in a way, we know it's coming if you have faith in the Lord Jesus. It's as good as yours. Stay in the faith. But this is speaking about the new Jerusalem, the new kingdom, the new earth, and all of that, and it's going to be good. There you will have perfection. You will have abundance, everything you need. You'll have fellowship with God directly. It's going to be good. So friends, do you see it? This is uh, packed. This, this phrase is packed with so much goodness. Zoe life in Christ in the new Jerusalem one day. All right. So we've established those things. Let's go back to the fight. Back to the fight. <clears throat> and you'll enjoy this, Don, because of where you've had us in Sunday school with this word and forms of it, right? Agonizomai is the word for fight in the Greek. It's present tense. So, friends, it means that this fight that you're in for the faith, is it going to end in this life, Jenny? Present tense means it's going to keep on going. There's no ending established, but we know, uh, Emily, back there, we know as long as we're in this life, it's going to be a battle, isn't it? Spiritual battle, Okay. And maybe in a sermon or two coming up, I'll tell you what the spiritual battle is not. We'll tell you a little bit today of what it is. It's about the faith. It's about the word. Uh, we'll tell you maybe about what it's not and what people have made it into in a couple sermons. But look at this. Present tense, meaning it's going to continue. And as it's used here in the text, this is a metaphorical fight. And what that means is the spiritual fight for the faith doesn't use ammon, doesn't use grenades or bullets or guns or tanks or boats. Uh, warships. It doesn't use any of that. It's a spiritual fight. And so we are to persevere while contending against opposition and temptation. That's what this agonism, this fight is about. So first of all, we learn that we're not in a picnic. Some of the false teachers out there will, will say to you that when you become a Christian, your life's going to be just rosy. Come to Jesus, friends. He's got an amazing, wonderful plan for your life. It's going to be great from here on out. Deb, has that worked out good for all of us? Can Deb? We have a tough life, don't we? It's tough. This, friends, this fight is not a picnic. Sadly, the, the Laodicean-style church of our day wants to make it about an attractional picnic or a rave or a party. I, I've seen a local camp that is all about making a laser light show and a rave kids are jumping around singing mindless songs. I watch what they're singing on the screen. I'm like, this is nonsense. Our modern Laodicean churches and camps are turning this into a picnic. They're not equipping the kids to fight this fight that's for their minds and their souls. It's sad. Not only are the churches producing this type of thing, but the camps are doing it and sending these kids back to the churches with a party attitude and, and that... Uh, I'm following Jesus because it was great. I, I climbed a rock wall and I, I hooped it up in a laser light show and we sang some awesome, cool songs. The problem with that is they're not being equipped with the truth that's going to help them in this fight. We at Ripley Church want to help parents, especially to help you equip your kids and, and, of course, adults. That's what we're doing Sunday after Sunday is equipping, getting ready, and actually continuing this fight. It's not a picnic. It's a battle, as Paul said. When will the picnic come? Mary, the picnic is going to come in the New Jerusalem, isn't it? In a way. You know what I mean. That's when, friends, can you, can you think of this? The new creation one day, the new universe, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, there will be no fallen angels, no demonic spirits. Our sin nature is gone. Where's disease? Gone. Death is gone. 
Morning is gone. Can you think of it? Can you think of it? And how amazing it's going to be. Shared with the uh, kids at Vacation Bible School too that we, we, we talked about the New Jerusalem and said, they, they got this, by the way, that it's in the third heaven. The air we breathe is number one. The second heaven is outer space. And beyond the creation then is the third heaven or heaven as we call it when people die. And it's where New Jerusalem is. It's a tangible city. It's beyond the curse. It's beyond corruption. It's God's city. Nothing corrupt or evil can enter his city and then stay there, I should say. Let me add that and dwell there uh, and stay. Of course, people are going to go there. Uh, all humans are going to go to this place and be judged um, whether you're in Christ or not. So in that sense, people will temporarily enter God's presence in that way. Those that are not in Christ will be told, I don't know you. Your name's not in the book of life. You didn't trust Christ. So, and then they're sent to the lake of fire. But friends, ultimately, ultimately this new Jerusalem will have nothing evil in it. So the kids got this concept. They, they, really, they really did. If no evil thing or evil person can stay in God's city, what has to happen? And they as kids shot their hands up and said, we have to believe in Jesus and he'll forgive us. They got this. So friends, your kids understand these things. If you'll teach them, they'll get this. So good to hear these kids understanding the truths. So it is a fight for souls. It's a fight for eternal destiny of people. That's why Paul put it this way. So, I kind of already answered the question, but let's just follow the slides here a minute. Well, I had a couple things that I didn't say. Let's go back a second. <laughs> the again, and you know what? As, as uh, AJ read the text, I forgot, oh, I missed a the. Annie, I missed one of the thes, and so I wrote it in my notes while I'm standing right there. We, we do that, we miss things. But the good fight, fight, we've already heard the word for that, agonizomai, the good fight of the faith. The here in front of good fight <clears throat> means it's one fight that is extremely and eternally worth engaging in. It's one fight that you, that Florine, uh, Florine and I had a great conversation this morning about some of these things. Florine, I love it because what you said ties with the sermon and more we're going to get to in a minute. So hang in there. But friends, this is an eternally important fight or thing that you can devote yourself to. Now, there are other nice causes to be involved in out there. I know that there's, there's clubs and things to do and, and that's fine. But this, this is the one thing, the faith, knowing the word of God, knowing Christ, being in Christ is one thing that is eternally worth it. That's what the the is there for. One good fight. And by the way, the word for good is noble, honorable fight. Good, noble, honorable thing to be involved in, the word of God. So now let's move forward to this question. <clears throat> Why is there a need for a fight or a striving to enter Christ's kingdom and the eternal life. Well, there are several things we could say, many things we could say, actually. Um, there are three main categories in this spiritual warfare and the opposition against each of us. Satan, of course, and uh, that includes, as you know, other fallen angels and demonic spirits, of course. He's the figurehead. So number one, it's a war because Satan opposes each of us. Number two, our own human pride, our own sin opposes us and is warring against us. And third, there's a fallen world system that has been in existence ever since the fall of man, but really more so Tower of Babel, where man organized and said, we're going to do it our way. And then God, of course, confused languages and spread people back out. And uh, our modern society today is a sort of reunifying of the Tower of Babel. Humanity's coming back together with various means globally and saying, we got this. We're gonna make a name for ourselves as humanity. And Jim, are they relying on God? No, the fallen world system is not relying on God, relying on themselves, their ingenuity, their brilliance, their planning. And in the end, it's gonna be judged by Christ, judged. So friends, these three things are at war against us. So you better know, John, we're in a war. I know you served overseas and you saw the environment over there, and you know that it was, it was a big deal. You had jobs to do, didn't you? You had certain things you had to do. They were your mission, your purpose, and you were over there in a time where, you know, potentially things could have broken out at any time. There was always a readiness for John as he served. So this war is being waged by Satan against God and humans, made in God's image. There's two kingdoms. There's only two. There's God's kingdom, 
And there's, of course, Satan's kingdom. And uh, I was telling uh, Seth and Deb at our staff meeting, I said, there's so many layers to this. And while I was preparing this sermon, my mind kept going deeper in all the levels. And I thought, no, that's, that's too much. So I backed it back up. And I want to say this, listen. This war is not a straight show of force. You know what I mean by that? It's not just, if God wanted to overcome the fallen angels, could he do it? He could. In an instant, he could vaporize them all into non-existence. God has chosen not to do that. And this may help answer the questions of, well, why does God allow all this to happen? That is up to God's sovereignty and his will. He has allowed all of this to take place. So it's not a straight show of force here. Don't get caught in that trap. Well, if God was really powerful, then he would just eradicate all this right now. No, he has a plan. And, and the way I explain it to folks is God is allowing this to take place within the laws and the principles of his created universe. So Emily, he made the universe, didn't he? And he made earth, he made all this heat and light and gravity and all these principles, and he made spiritual principles, and he set it into motion. And he's intimately involved with it still, of course. But he set these things as he wanted it, right? And so God is still allowing these things to operate as they, as they will. People have babies and families, and you raise them, you train them, and all that stuff. But God also intervenes in very, very significant ways within that creation. He sent his son, right, Bill? That's God sending help into the creation. So he's very active. So the interesting thing is here, God is working within what he created, but he's also coming with supernatural things to bring salvation to the world. I just want to throw that in. Uh, but the ultimate purpose here is to reveal those who are in Christ's kingdom, that is God's kingdom, or number two, Satan's kingdom. What about you today? Which kingdom do you belong to? If you're not born again in Jesus the Christ, then you're still part of Satan's kingdom. We're all born into it, by the way. We're all conceived in our mother's womb, automatically in Satan's kingdom. And so Jesus' ministry of reconciliation Satan's kingdom and bring us into his kingdom of light, of truth, and of his kingdom. Friends, it's a war. Only two sides. There's no other side. There's no, other, there's no neutral territory in this fight. You can't just say, well, pastor, that's all well and good, but I'm going to sit this one out. I believe, but I'm just going to sit on the sideline. No, dangerous. You might end up finding yourself like some who have walked away from the faith. As Paul said, they've wandered away pierce themselves through, and some even to the point of being lost. So where are you? Stay in Christ. Stay in Christ. We have no human power, by the way, no human power to overcome any of these three things. But Christ did. Bonnie, isn't that awesome? Jesus overcame all three of those categories, all of them. Overcame Satan, human pride and sin, the fallen world system. Wonderful. There's... 12 or 13 sermons in each one of those, those things about what Christ did. I'll trust you to go home and look into that for yourself. Christ defeated them all. And so, but we are also to carry on the fight. Again, Bill, not with tanks and bombs and guns. You don't go get your shotgun. I'm, gonna, I'm here to fight the good fight, pastor. I would say, no, nah, Bill, wrong weapon. Instead, what do you need? The only weapon, the sword of the word. This is the only, only, only offensive weapon. We, of course, have the armor of Christ. Every piece is Christ. Uh, of course, but this is our weapon. It's a spiritual weapon. It's not a tangible, well, it is tangible, but I mean, it's not shooting people with a gun. It's taking the, the word of God and sharing with people. So that is how we are to carry on the fight. Let's take a quick look at each one of these three, just real quick, because again, we could spend a lot of time. Number one, Satan has a desire to be God. He wants to be his own God, and he wants worshipers. So much of the world right now are actually worshipers of Satan. Oh, pastor, Satan worshipers? Yeah, not in the pentagram and weird spells and all that kind of Satan worshipers. But those who are not in Christ are actually following and worshiping, in a sense, Satan and his kingdom. You don't want to be there because that's going to be judged by, by Christ very, very powerfully. So Satan's weapons, what are they? You guys know some of these. What are they? Lying about God and other things, lying about Jesus. There's so much of that out there, right? Deception, appeal to the human fleshly desires that will draw us away from God. Promoting, listen to this one, promoting a worldly global order. That's actually number three. 
Satan is promoting this idea that man is going to fix all of his problems by himself. And one of them, the main one, I believe, is Satan spread the lie to humanity that we can be our own gods. That's at war with our soul, Emily, isn't it? That is at war with our soul, that we think we can be our own gods. This is a tough lie to combat, by the way, because most people want to feel good about themselves. We all kind of want to feel good about ourselves. And so this idea that I'm my own God allows me to feel pretty good about myself. I'm a pretty good person. And that's all part of the self-righteous lie as well. And so thankfully, Jesus battled against that through the cross and all the work that he did. Number two, human pride. God is, is, war, is warring against the pride of humanity. He's at war against it. It's also called the flesh. So sometimes when you hear me talk about the flesh, we're not talking about this, skin and bones and blood, although that you know, can be a part of it. We're talking here about man's sinful nature, the flesh. So God is at war against our pride, our fleshliness. And this is a war. This is a war because people do not recognize that they're not good. I've had so many people over the years say, well, they're good people. They're good people. That people group is a good group of people. How dare you, pastor, say that they're not? All I say is, do these people know Christ? That's the question. Are they in Christ by faith? They're not good people. And even if they are in Christ, where does the goodness come from, Don? It comes from Christ. His righteousness, right? His goodness is made ours only by his grace. So friends, be careful with this. Because the war against our human pride is a tough one. Because we humans want to feel self-important and we want to feel like we got it all together and, and this is a hard one to battle against. Most people won't agree. They won't confess it. And, and ultimately then they won't humble themselves before Christ. So, how do we break down pride? Sword of the word. What does the sword do? It pierces our souls and shows us that we are wretched sinners. That's why when you share the, your faith sometimes, Bill, you can use the law rightly. Now, there are many groups out there using the law of God incorrectly. We'll talk about that some other day. The law of God is not to be used as a character building curriculum for unbelievers. That's a bad use of the law, wrong use of the law. The right use of the law is this. Bill, have you ever told a lie? He has. Thank you for being honest, Bill, but you're still a liar. Uh, have you ever uh, taken anything that wasn't yours? Probably have. Yep, he admits. Okay, we could go on and on. We basically can give people the Ten Commandments. And we're not doing this to be mean or high and mighty, because we've broken them too. But if we went on with Bill, as we, we expose more and more and get him to confess, yeah, I have told lies. Well, then you are a liar. Out of his own mouth comes the truth that he is in big trouble. And then if you, you follow this line of, of sharing the gospel, you get them to a point of saying, I'm guilty, heaven or hell. Still, some people will say, heaven. Well, why? Well, God forgives, and they give a generic answer, but they haven't personally received salvation. You see the point, friends? The sword of the word, our weapon, will get in and pierce the soul and root out the fact that they are lawbreakers spiritually deserving the lake of fire. Then you give them the other edge of that sword, which is Christ, the only savior, you see? But if we're just given one edge, it's ineffective. If we're just telling people, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. If you start there and you stay there, they're gonna go, yeah, I kind of love me too. I'm glad God loves me. I'm glad to hear he's got a great plan for my life. Great, okay? I guess I'm a Christian now, right? No. Friends, it does not get in and pierce and pierce through the human pride. So you must use the word of God in its totality, the law and grace in your sharing of the gospel to pierce through that pride. You see, in Jesus' day, the, all, a lot of his teaching, a lot of his parables, actually, most of his parables, were, uh, it was about combating the false belief of self-righteousness. I'm gonna keep hammering on this because that is the context of how we understand what Jesus did. He was coming toward the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowd, the people. They all believed that they were good Jewish people. They kept God's rules. They kept the rabbi's man-made rules. So we're good, right? No, what's Paul say? No one is justified by what? By works. No one is justified by keeping the law. That was the point of the law was to 
right? They'll show them that they have a great need for Christ. Jesus was battling against self-righteousness. Do you see it? What's going on in the churches today? Many churches today, and I could name categories of them, are all about works and sacraments and, and doing stuff. They're doing the same thing the Pharisees did. Oh, if I just do these things, if I just serve here and do this good thing there, I'll be good with God, right? That's not what it's about. The sword of the word must pierce through this stuff. The same thing Jesus taught against is happening today, and that's why we must wield the sword. So people must see that they need Christ. They must. And that comes through the use of the law, the proper use. Pride then can be put to death. This is not a picnic, friends. If you want to try to talk people about Christ and do it in the way of the master Jesus, it's not a picnic. Uh, it, it's going to be a war for their minds and their souls. But don't give up. As Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, pursue these things. Do them. And the final category up there is the follow world system. Now, my notes are probably this long. I'll cut it down to less. But friends, um, there is a promotion of a global government that is growing and growing in our world today. The World Economic Forum met recently in Davos, Switzerland, and boy, was it a humdinger. They have some plans for humanity, and it includes reducing the world's population. I think it was by half. That's their desire anyway in the next couple years. How are they going to do this? They say, we got too many people crawling around on the world. Ah, uh, time out. What's your biblical worldview tell you? God made the earth for who? People. Animals and plants too, but yeah, people. But yet the global world system, who is, which is ungodly by the way, they aren't worshiping Jesus and they aren't going to God's word for their cues. They're coming up with this in their own hearts, which are depraved and lost. And they're saying, we must reduce the world's population by half in the next couple of years. How are they going to do this? I'll submit to you, they've already tried a couple methods. And by the way, every generation has had its antichrist where Satan thought, this is the one that I will use to bring my kingdom to the earth. Hitler was one of such people. And Stalin and Mao and Karl Marx. And there's always, but every generation has had an antichrist. The word says so. Many antichrists are going to come along. That is, ungodly leaders that are going to want to put their kingdom into place. But then there will be what? the Antichrist, as we come up toward Christ's return. There will be the one where Satan's going to think, I got my man. This man is going to bring my kingdom to the world. But what does Jesus do? I'll read it for you later. It's coming. Florine, it's coming in Thessalonians. We were talking a little bit about that this morning. But friends, this global world system, new world order, whatever you want to call it, is coming. How can I say it with such confidence? Because Thessalonians talks about it, Revelation talks about it, Daniel talks about it, other places talk about it. It's coming. So, Denise, is this an avoidable thing? No. Revelation says these are the things which must take place. They're going to happen by God's allowance. It's going to happen. So, friends, we've got to arm ourselves with the fact that things are going to get rougher. Oh, pastor, you're so negative. I go home every day discouraged. Oh, stop. Stop it. These truths must be understood so that we counter it with what? With who? With Christ, with the faith, with the word of God. That is what will help us push through these tough times that are coming. I don't know if they're coming tomorrow or next week. Some of the younger people get upset. Oh, don't talk like that. I got a life I want to live. And I say, time out. Live your life, but you better be sure you're in Christ's kingdom. Right? Y'all agree? Make sure you're in Christ's kingdom. Yeah, keep living life. Go to work, do your thing, be a productive citizen, but make sure you're in Christ. Make sure that you're in Christ. So the globalists are calling for a great reset. And friends, this used to be a secretive thing. I remember both of the Bushes who were presidents talked about the new world order way back in the day. I should take and show you the YouTube videos. Calling for a new world order back then. Nothing new since uh, Genesis 11, but the globalists are getting more bold. They're right out there with it. We need a new order. We need a reset. And what they're saying is we want to um, bring all of the nations down to a level, eliminate various currencies, eliminate national governments, and they want to create a worldwide system of government. It's right in Revelation. It's right there. They want to suppress world economies. They want to eventually bring us to digital currency. Guess why? No longer can you pay your babysitter with a little, you know, 20 bucks. 
You're going to have to swipe a phone or do something. And guess what? All your transactions are trackable, traceable. Everything you buy or sell will be known by the entities, by Google and all those guys. So friends, this is coming. It's actually here. We have no clue how long this will be the setup before, before it all takes hold. Uh, the word talks about them claiming peace and security or peace and safety. More on that in a minute. Social credit scores. Um, China's already doing this. So all of your social interactions are rated by the government. And um, if you have a pretty good credit score, you can go on the trains and buses and have great jobs and you can do stuff. But if your credit score falls, your social credit score falls, then you might not get to travel. You might be actually like told to stay in your home. So these things are real, and they may, they may come to America. They will come to America eventually. Um, a globalist, Klaus Schwab, said, uh, he's kind of like the, the, one of the kingpins here recently, people will own nothing and be happy about it. Doesn't sound like the American way. No, of course. Um, and by the way, private property, is that a biblical thing? Watch me. Yep. The Old Testament laws that God gave to his people actually govern the proper use and care for private property. So that is a God-given right. But this will be taken by the globalists. So again, I could go on and on. It gets a little grim, I know, I know. But there are other things that they're doing that I won't even talk about. Um, The global system will be run by 10 kings and an antichrist and a false prophet, and they will be the main players. But you know what else? Uh, The word tells us that Christ will make war against this evil system. Then in Revelation 19, his followers, having been prepared in heaven, will return with him, and he will judge the global system. He will judge it. And then he will set up his kingdom and rule for a thousand years. That's why we talk about this, because we need to fight and strive to understand that there is a global system coming. There are so many people are going to be deceived by this. Even people in the churches all over America, around the world, they're going to, well, well, pastor, I, I got to go with this thing because I got to have my community standing and I want my goodies and I got to have all my stuff. So I can't, I, I got to go. But be careful that you don't give uh, your, your salvation and Christ up for the temporal things of this world. Be awake. So as we close today, I'm going to share with you just a few scriptures that are going to help us understand this is a war. A war. And many, many people have given up on the truth and given up on Christ. So let's take a look. First Thessalonians 4. I know it's a lot, but just hang with me. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. It means that those have died. That you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Time out. Look at the yellow. I love this. I share this at funerals now because it's so amazing. He'll bring with... God will bring with Jesus those who have died. Down here it says the dead in Christ will rise first. What? Watch this. Those coming with Christ in the air, that's their soul. Of Like let's just pick my mother-in-law Loretta. When this occurs, she's a believer, any of the believers that are dead now, their soul will be sent with Christ. Where's their body? In In the ground. That's what it's saying down here. The dead in Christ will rise first means that their dead body will constitute and go up. Now, you got to go read a bunch of scripture to get this, but 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how that perishable, rotted, gone body will be reconstituted out of the dust of the ground. It will be changed from perishable to imperishable to something that has decayed and it was sick and dead to something that will live forever. This is good stuff. But we got to understand this passage right. The souls will come with Christ because where have they been? Where have the souls of our loved ones been that know Christ? In the new Jerusalem. God will say, it's time, go. And the souls will come back, the bodies will rise, and then body will be brought up. And as it goes up, it will be made imperishable, perfect. And the soul spirit, which has been in God's presence, remember I said earlier, nothing impure can be in the new Jerusalem. So when my mother-in-law Loretta, even though she was a sinner here, when she was taken by the angels and taken to new Jerusalem, what happened to her? Her soul spirit was perfected in Christ, right? Amazing. Her soul spirit was perfected in Christ. So her soul spirit in New Jerusalem was righteous. Now the, she was not, her salvation was not totally done until her body was resurrected and made perfect. And that will happen in this account when Christ comes for the harpazo or the rapture as you know it. 
Souls will come, bodies will go up, bodies made perfect on the way up, reunited body, soul, and spirit. Good stuff, amazing. So those of us who are alive when this occurs will not go ahead of those who have, have died or are dead. So they will go first in order, and then we who are alive or left will be caught up. That's the word, caught up. Harpazo is the Greek. Rapture, rapio, the Latin. Caught, snatched up like that. <clears throat> to meet the Lord in the air, and then we will be with him always. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Florine, are you encouraged? Yes. But we talked about this morning. You are encouraged because you know God's word. You have the faith. You have this, don't you? And so you know this. This is for you one day. One day, you and I, this is us. Is that true of all of you here? I pray so. Those listening online, is that true of you? Are you in Christ so that when this occurs, you go? Or are you gonna be left? To what's coming next. Paul puts a lot in these texts. Go read the first and second Thessalonians. Amazing stuff. Now concerning these times and seasons, he, he said, I don't have a reason to write to you. He was with them at another occasion and he told them all about this stuff. But they had confusion that arose and so he told them more. So the yellow, you yourselves are fully aware. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The blue is for people who are unbelievers. The green for believers. So people are going to say peace and security. Where have we heard that before? safe. Can they? No. But the word of the day is peace and safety, peace and security through global peace plans and, and our program of science and medicine and on and on and on and on. We've brought utopia to the world. No, false, because it says sudden destruction will come upon those as labor pains come upon a, upon a pregnant woman. They will not escape for they've committed themselves to the FWS, fallen world system. Now, next is a spiritual metaphor, the green. But you guys, if you're in Christ, you're not of the darkness spiritually. You're not spiritually dark, you're spiritually light in Christ. That day shouldn't surprise you. You're children of the day. So then let us not sleep. Now, they're not talking about taking a nap this afternoon, Jana. Even though we're going to need a nap. It's been a wonderful vacation Bible school week, but we're ready for a nap. Not talking about sleeping physically. We're talking about spiritual sleep. Ripley Church, be awake. There is a global reset. There is a global government coming at some point. Be aware. Don't be sucked in by this stuff. Be awake. Be sober. The blue. For those who sleep, that is those who are not in Christ, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. That's just talking about spiritual lostness. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith. Man, there's so much in here. Go home and read it. Drink it in, a helmet of hope, of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, meaning dead or alive, goes back to the prior chapter, whether people are dead or alive, we live in him. We're gonna be resurrected, made new. Encourage one another and build one another up. You see that again and again, Florine? Encourage Florine with this. Florine encouraged Pastor Eric with this. And she did, I appreciate that. She had some great testimonies this morning. I love that. A couple more, and then we're going to be done. Don't give up. Persevere. Hupo mene, right? Bear up under this. This is good stuff. 2 Thessalonians 2, and there's so much in here, we're not going to cover most of it. But it says this, and you know what is restraining him. Who is the him? The Antichrist. Now so that he may be revealed in his proper time. Hitler was not the guy. Stalin was not the guy. Genghis Khan was not the guy. On and on it goes. But at the proper time, God will allow him to be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already working. Only he who now restrains will do so till he is taken out of the way. So there is a he who is a restrainer. Who do you think that might be? The Holy Spirit within the church. Yeah. Whom the Lord Jesus, let's see, uh, the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Wow. Jesus is going to be a warrior. He is a warrior. Kids, he's a warrior. With the word of his mouth, he's going to destroy the work of the Antichrist and the Antichrist, and they will be sent actually alive into the lake of fire. They will be in a resurrected body. All people will, by the way. Everyone's going to be raised, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt in the lake of fire. This is warfare, not a picnic. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of who? You still with me? Who? 
Satan is behind all this by his power, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, those who are not in Christ. Because why? Here it is. This ties to our sermon today, our passage in 1 Timothy. Why? Right here. They refuse to love the truth, the faith, the truth of Scripture, and so be what? Saved. Saved. Where are you today? Where are you on watching online? Where are you with this today? Christ, the truth. Don't refuse him. Submit to him. Put your faith in him. Therefore, God sends them, that is the unbelievers, a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth of Christ but had the pleasure in unrighteousness. Powerful. Great truth. Write these things down. Go home. Look them over for yourself. And finally today, here's the the I missed, Annie. Thanks for hanging with me today. We had a long week, but you hung with me. Here's the the that I missed. Let's see, where to go? There's a couple of them in here. Take hold of the eternal life. See it again, the eternal life. We talked about that earlier. To which you were called and about which you made the good confession. We'll get to that in a second. The good confession. So first of all, he's talking here to Timothy, right? First and foremost, but also extends to all elders and pastors and all of you. Be committed to the faith regarding the eternal life. We must. Paul is encouraging all to do this. But today's growing false Laodicean church culture, mega churches promoting life coaching pep talks, nope. False word of faith churches promising absolute health, wealth, and prosperity, nope. Attractional type churches entertaining people to keep them coming, no. The faith. The good confession. Do you see why the was used for confession? What is he confessing here? What do you think he's confessing? The word. The faith. Christ. You see it? Is your confession line up with the Bible? Does your confession line up with Scripture? That's what's being said here. There is one confession, and that is Jesus the Christ. And he did this in the presence of many witnesses. I'm doing the same today in the presence of you all, the witnesses. Now, Ammon, you have witnesses out there, don't you, that I'll never touch. I'll never be able to meet the people you know. I won't have the influence that, that you have with them. Your personality, your rapport, your circle, you are the one that can confess the faith, the eternal life in the presence of your witnesses. That's pretty exciting. All of us, same thing. You guys all are gonna to touch people, I never will. You'll, you'll be out there doing these things. So as I wrap up today to say this, the fight is gonna to get tougher. You all ready for this? Uh, it wasn't very exciting. I'm not asking for, I'm not asking for, I'm just teasing you. Um, but that's what a lot of the, are you ready for, they went, they went shouting and screaming. But I just wanna ask a serious question. Are you ready for this? Satan, human pride, and a big one that's gonna impact us more and more is the, the new world order, the global government. Are you ready? Make sure you belong to Christ by faith. And let's keep growing in the faith. We're gonna to conclude today with a very appropriate song, Trust and Obey. So let's do that. Let me pray for us as Don comes up. Lord, thank you for this word today. I know it was a lot of scripture, but hey, this is, this is wonderful stuff. So help our people to go home and get their Bibles out and pour back through this. Make it their own. And that's the only way that it's going to impact them as, as it should. So thank you for this day of worship in Christ's name. Amen. We ask if you're ready for this, and this is the song for it, Trust and Obey. So let's stand together and, and sing this as we close today's worship.
Thank you, God, for all the folks that have gathered here today and those online watching as well. We just are so grateful to be able to meet and see people in person and interact and encourage each other. We need that so desperately. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us. And we look forward to how you will use our lives this week uh, for the faith, for the gospel. So thank you for this and bless everyone as they go and, and empower them by your spirit and be with them in Christ's name. Amen.